Hello Internet and welcome to my video about Margrethe the First of Denmark, Norway and Sweden with their respective dominions and empires. Margrethe was a girl who was married off for fairly short term political reasons when she was six and who managed to claw her way in 20 years after that to rule the entire Scandinavian peninsula plus Denmark. So yeah, an interesting character to say the least. She was in all probability the most powerful woman in her own right between Empress Irene in the late uh, 8th century and Elizabeth I of England who I hopefully don't need to tell anyone watching this channel, was in the late 16th century. But yeah, I, uh, I say let's get on with it. Margrethe I of Scandinavia. Enjoy. Now, for obvious reasons we can't start directly with Margaret, we need to at least sort of set up the scene. So, you know, time for backstory. E now, Margrethe's father was called Valdemar. His nickname was Day Again, and while there is some discussion about why he was having that particular name, um, rumors sort of tend to indicate that it has to do with the fact that uh, he basically reunited the Danish kingdom. That is at least the um, sort of explanation used today. Though there has been a couple of others suggested throughout the years. However, Valdemar did in fact present a fairly interesting character himself. Because before his time, his immediate ancestors had been, how to put it, less than superbly competent. And had, due to lack of funds and bad wars and so on, basically lost every last single bit of Denmark. Its entire landmass was pawned off specifically to some North German dukes and counts who then, well, they held the country, basically, in not as rulers, theoretically, but as owners of the land due to having, well, purchased it during pawnage situations. This eventually became so bad that for a seven-year period from uh, 1340 to 1347, there simply was no king of Denmark because there was not really a Denmark to be king of, while uh, Count Gerhard of uh, Holstein specifically had control over most of uh, the Danish realm. Gerhard himself was killed during an uprising, and eventually this fellow Valdemar, son of the last Danish king, managed to claim the throne and part of the Jutland Peninsula. Over the next 20 or so years, Valdemar, in a, how do you put it, surprisingly brutal and single-minded fashion, managed to either purchase back or by war, win most of the old Danish uh, areas, at least the areas that are today sort of defined by Denmark. Uh, what he was lacking was the old core lands that I have been mentioning in a few other videos in uh, Scania and uh, basically southern Sweden. However, he had a plan because he had this daughter of his, Margrethe, she was about six years old and she was the last of his six children. Now, the king of Sweden had two sons. The king of Sweden was named Magnus. He had two sons. One was Hakon, who he had managed to place on the throne of Norway. Hakon was 18 at the time. He also had a kid by the name of Eric. And Eric had raised a rebellion against his father taken over south of Sweden and established himself as a, you know, pretender king there. Well, not really pretender king, since he had complete control of the area. Magnus, of course, wasn't too fond of that. So, what do we do? Well, let's say we ally through marriage between Harkon and Valdemar's daughter Margrethe, so the two were then bound to help each other against Eric. 
and perhaps just as important against the rising power of the Hanse uh, Fed Confederation. If you don't know what that is, I will probably get back to that in another video, but it was a confederation of North German trading towns which had achieved phenomenal amounts of power in the uh, Baltic region during this particular period. Anyway, Valdemar and Magnus made this agreement and Margrethe was duly engaged to Harkon uh, when she was six and he was 18. So she was now the future queen of Norway. Um, in the deal, Valdemar then had uh, Scania returned to him as part of the Alliance Treaty. Now, you will remember me saying that the um, ideas behind this particular marriage treaty was fairly short term. Well, again, it, it was for Magnus. He just wanted an ally against his rebellious son, and for Valdemar, he wanted to regain the Danish core lands that his ancestors so stupidly had pawned to Sweden about uh, 30 years prior. So, he decided, well, I can't really wait until we defeat Eric together, so I say, you don't have to worry, Magnus, I will take my army and I will go over to Scania and I will kick out your rebellious son myself. So he tried that. Well, I mean, I don't say he necessarily tried that because he obviously didn't really care about the areas of southern Sweden that wasn't part of the old Danish uh, designs, but that was his excuse to take his very large, very well-equipped Danish army over to Scania, take a lot of fortresses, and basically take over that particular area. So, well, you know, it was supposedly a war against Eric, so Magnus couldn't really complain. But Valdemar wasn't done yet because he still wanted to regain the position of Denmark having the most powerful sort of, um, well, position in the Nordics, basically. So he also took the island of Gotland, which is far away from any of the areas that he was supposed to be on, uh, having control with, on an island in the Swedish side of the Baltic on, on uh, like I said, Gotland with uh, the main city of Visby. Now, Visby was basically a member of the Hansestadt Confederation at the time and was almost to a certain degree a nearly German town. Valdemar, however, still took that uh, by beating the local uh, peasant army in a fight and laying siege to the town until it, well, surrendered very, very quickly. At this point, Valdemar was, in fact, the most powerful king in the Nordics and had complete control mostly over the sea lanes through the Baltic with its tremendous uh, wealth through its trade lanes. Now, this was, of course, something that um, the Hansestats and even Magnus uh, could not actually, uh, you know, agree to. So they immediately imposed a trade embargo on Valdemar and also Magnus called off the wedding between Margrethe and his son and instead argued that his son should marry the daughter of one of the Holsteinian dukes that Valdemar actually was at war with. On her way to Sweden, however, a storm drove her ship onto Bornholm, which was then and now a Danish island, where she was captured by the local archbishop on the fortress of Hammershus, or Hammer House. Uh, and he kept her prison there because he said, well, she's going to marry someone who's already engaged to someone else. That's against church law. So, yeah. This left Magnus in an uncomfortable position, but he couldn't really do anything about it because with Gotland taken, Valdemar, at least for the present, controlled the sea, so there was very little to do. However, at this point, fate intervened. You remember Eric, the traitorous or at least rebellious son of Magnus that the marriage had originally been directed at? Yeah, well, he up and died. That happened at the time. With him dead, uh, the Swedish areas sort of returned to um, <clears throat> uh, Magnus, and he didn't really have any reason to be particularly angry anymore. So the marriage between Margrethe and Hakon was back on to reseal the alliance. So, you know, Valdemar didn't get any good ideas about perhaps taking the rest of Sweden. And so in... 1363, when Margrethe was about 10, she was married to um, 
Haken in Copenhagen. Now, since she was that young and the marriage was primarily for alliance reasons, it probably took some time before she joined her husband in Norway, but she seemed to have been there at least already the next year because a couple of things happened in 1364. First of all, Christopher, the Duke of Lollen, died. Now, I haven't mentioned Christopher, the Duke of Lollen, before, so you have no reason to know who, she, who he was, but he was Magretta's older brother, and he was Valdemar's only son. And this kind of meant that uh, Denmark was suddenly without an heir, and her father didn't really have a male heir. Uh, so, suddenly, Magretta and her husband were in a quite different position than... Uh, they had been only just a few months before regarding Denmark. It was something to pay attention to. Also, what happened in uh, 1364 was that the Swedish nobles got tired of King Magnus and threw him out, while, of course, therefore also removing Margaret's husband, Harkon, from the Swedish secession, and instead installed a, a certain Albert of Mecklenburg as King of Sweden. So, yeah... Things were absolutely getting interesting, even after only one year of marriage. It is, of course, worth noticing that Haken remained king of Norway because the Swedish nobles and Albrecht had absolutely no power to do anything about him over there, and the Norwegians were quite happy with their king. Uh, also, of course, with his daughter now securely on the throne of Norway, Valdemar had great interest in supporting his son-in-law, especially as his ally was now kicked out of Sweden. So, yeah... Mar Margrethe's position with her husband in Norway was quite well set. However, since Denmark was still without an heir, this seemed to have been where Margrethe's position in Denmark sort of started to change a bit. Instead of a, well, spare girl child used to seal an alliance, at this point she seemed to have started to at least get further into the Danish power circles as, you know, someone who might eventually... If Valdemar himself couldn't remarry and produce another heir, then, you know, Margrethe, if she had any children, could absolutely do so. And this is basically what happened, because Margrethe and Haken eventually had a son after about five years of marriage called Olaf. And in 1375, after 11 years of marriage, her father Valdemar finally died. Now, again, I will probably return to Valdemar in a video of his own because he's also very interesting and uh, a very complicated character with a very fascinating history. But in this particular case, I just feel his daughter is, well, more interesting, to be perfectly honest. Anyway, with Margrethe's son Olaf as the primary heir of Denmark, she basically managed to have Margrethe made Olaf king of Denmark. Now, there were a couple of others who had sort of holds on Denmark, but uh, Margrethe insisted that Olaf had to be the guy, and with her 10 years of, you know, I don't want to say worming her way into Danish power circles, but working her way into Danish power circles, this was done, and she was, of course, declared as his regent. So at this point, Margrethe ruled Denmark in the name of her uh, of her five-year-old son while ruling Norway alongside her husband. Well, she probably didn't rule Norway very much because there's no indication that Haken was in any way a bad king or a weak king, but she was queen of Norway with her husband while also regent of Denmark with her uh, uh, for her son. One of the things she insisted on, of course, because Margaret was a smart girl, was he was also proclaimed rightful heir of Sweden, because Harkon had never actually given up his holds on Sweden, even though he didn't really have the power to go over there and take it back from Elbrecht and the um, uh, uh, Swedish nobles. In the years that followed, Margrethe proved herself a very shrewd, very competent, and very ruthless ruler of Denmark, holding the country in the name of her son, uh, and absolutely continuing many of the poli best policies of her father while 
perhaps throwing out some of the less successful policies of her father and basically re-establishing Denmark after his rule that has done the Legman where the you know journeyman's work re-establishing Denmark as the most prominent kingdom in the north especially through its direct alliance with the Kingdom of Norway, which was, of course, her husband's area, uh, country. Now, this lasted until 1380, so about five years, because then Haken died young, which was apparently very sad to Margrethe, as she never remarried or anything. But this also meant, of course, that Olaf became king of Norway. He was still too young to rule, naturally. So now Margrethe was queen of Norway and also their regent for her young son. So now she had direct rule of both Norway and Denmark. So yeah, things were absolutely going in the right direction for our girl here. Now, it took a problematic turn in 1387 when at around 17, year old, 17 years old, Olaf went and died. This, of course, would mean that theoretically there was a large royal crisis in Denmark and Norway, which would also, of course, have meant the death knell of Margrethe's attempts to gain Sweden for Olaf uh, through uh, Harkin's claim to the throne, but as I've said, Margrethe was a clever girl, and she, of course, had a plan. So, while she was still in mourning over her son, she was of sound enough mind, so to speak, to put through a, um, well, a plot, and it worked. You see, down in Pomerania, she had this grand-nephew called Borgislau, he was, at this particular time, around five or six years old, and he had some um, sad tragedy, uh, uh, tragic loss of his parents. So what did Margrethe do? Well, she adopted him and his sister. So, at this point, we actually had a new king of Norway and Denmark, namely Borgislau, who changed his name to Eric, known today as Eric of Pomerania. And, of course, since he was also about five, well, Queen Margrethe of Norway and sovereign lady and, and regent of Denmark had to sort of continue her regentship um, and continue to rule the kingdoms now in the name of Eric rather than in the name of Olaf. And so she did. So, yeah, clever girl, as I said. Now, at this particular time in the late 1380s, um, the Swedish nobles were getting really tired of Elbrecht of Mecklenburg, the king they had installed instead of Harkin's father, Magnus, because he was basically in alliance with the Hansestadt, and the Swedish nobles basically feared that they had thrown out a guy they didn't really like in order to put a guy on the throne who didn't care even the slightest bit about them, and had basically begun to turn Sweden into a vassal of some North German merchants. So they started a small rebellion that didn't really work, so everything was, you know, not going well, but they thought, ha, huh, we have Margrethe over in Denmark. And she was like, well, you know, my son held the claim to Sweden. I am now holding it on behalf of my adopted son, because why not? So they basically came to Margrethe and said that if she would help to get uh, rid of Albert, she would become their regent as well until a suitable king could be established. And, of course, Margrethe, having basically probably waited for this moment ever since she became any kind of power broker in her own, immediately gathered up her combined Danish and Norwegian forces and invaded Sweden. At this point, it's not really certain whether or not Albert was actually in Sweden and left to gather forces in northern Germany or if he was back in his home country of northern Germany, but uh, Margrethe quickly took most of the country except for Stockholm, the capital, which was by now almost a German city and which held out. It was at this point uh, also that Albert uh, began, began to call her King Pantsless. 
you know, king with no pants, which was basically the nickname that stuck to her for the rest of her life. Uh, he, of course, meant it derogatory, but everyone else, uh, well, it was one of those situations where, you know, you claim a, um, a bad nickname and make it into something positive, because Margreta started using it about herself, and her supporters started using it about her, and, well, it stuck with her for the rest of her life as a testament to just despite her being, you know, despite her being a woman, she was as effective as any king, whether or not she wore pants or not, and trust me, she was. Now, the Swedish nobles wasn't actually all that very happy about uh, suddenly becoming part of a uh, domain under Margrethe that also included Denmark and Norway, uh, despite what they had previously stated. They had probably hoped that Margrethe would help them kick out Albert, and then they could, you know, kick out her. However, her army over there that hadn't actually fought a battle was way, way, way too powerful. And so in 1380, uh, 1388, at Dalibor Castle, the Swed Swedish were basically forced to accept all of Margaret's condition and also elected her sovereign lady and ruler of Sweden and pledged themselves to accept any king that she might choose to rule Sweden. So yeah, that was the moment. Basically there, 1388. March 1388, no one knows exactly when our girl Margrethe had in what was basically 24 years since her marriage conquered, taken, and now controlled Norway, Denmark, and Sweden completely in her own right as ruler most powerful ruler in Northern Europe at this time. Her power was at this point rivaling even some of the greater powers further south, who was, of course, at this moment also so, uh, kind of riddled with war, so they couldn't in any way unite against her. Her fleet was completely controlling of the Baltic and its um, trade routes at this point, no matter what the Hansestadt might have wanted. So, yeah. 1388, and our girl Margrethe married off at the age of six to seal a short-lived alliance to basically gain three um, fortresses and some land areas in southern Sweden, now controlled the entire Scandinavian peninsula, plus Greenland, the Faroe Islands, the Shetland Island, Iceland, and Finland, plus various areas that are now northern Germany. Well done, girl. Now, Albrecht was not, of course, taking this lying down, which no one, of course, could have uh, expected. So the year after, he returned with a fairly large army of North German mercenaries and tried to regain Sweden. However, Margaret's forces were large, they were well-trained, and they were led by a fairly decent commander from, also funnily enough, from Mecklenburg, called Henrik Parov. And during a big battle of Falschirping, though General Parov was killed, her forces utterly routed the Albrecht's mercenary army and captured uh, the man himself. Now, Margaret was completely omnipotent ruler of all the Scandinavian peninsula with no actual rivals. She held the only person who was against her in a prison. She was incredibly beloved in both Norway and Denmark, so there was no real reason to fear any threat there. And the Swedes was, at this point, basically realizing, yeah, we might not particularly like the fact that we are now under her, but, you know, she's a really good queen. We like her. So, yeah. Things were get things were getting getting really really good. The only place that held out, as I said, was at this point still Stockholm, where Albrecht had landed with his army and where a substantial garrison was still was still placed. Um, this meant that there was still one place where unrest could ferment, and the Mecklenburg rulers, plus a lot of other of Margrethe's uh, foes, now basically conspired to destroy trade in the um, uh, Baltic by sending out tons and tons and tons of pirates and corsairs and also making war on a lot of other fronts. Magratta, however, basically ignored them for quite a while, content with ruling, well, all of Sweden, Norway and Denmark and strengthening the realms, 
do uh, strengthening its infrastructure, removing annoying nobles, placing no better nobles in their position, and basically, you know, just making things work out very well for them. And eventually, of course, the disruption of trade meant that the Hanseatic uh, Federation, or the Hanseatic League, as it was called, basically had to step in and squash some of their own allies' attempt at war with uh, Margreta, while also, of course, imposing at least some face-saving measures upon her. And so in the Compact of Lindholm, which was in 1395, so at this point Margaret had been ruling Scandinavia for six years alone, she uh, released Albert on his promise to pay, within six years, 60,000 silver marks. Because if he didn't, he would then, of course, still be free, but he would also have to relinquish all of his claims on Sweden in any kind, way, shape or fashion. Now, this meant that the Hansa League was to hold Stockholm as surety uh, on, instead of Albrecht's direct allies. Albrecht then failed to pay the ransom within the stipulated time, as Margrethe basically knew he would, because, of course... His uh, money flow had also been disrupted by these pirates out in the Baltic, and so that meant that the Hansa surrendered Stockholm to Magretta in September of 1398 in return for some commercial privileges while throwing Albrecht under the bus. And there we have it, 1398. Magretta was in total control over every part of the Scandinavian peninsula, and its dominions, with no enemies left to oppose her. Good going, girl. I would say girl power, but I'm sure she would actually be offended if anyone were to throw that one at her. Now, at this point, Eric uh, of Pomerania, as I mentioned before, was of course growing up. However, at this point, basically all of the various countries in the Nordics were like, yeah, we're okay with Eric. But we actually like you a lot better, my, uh, my queen. So the Swedes, even those who had previously been a bit wary about her, basically said, we're okay if you last the rest of your life without giving us a king. Just make sure we actually have an heir to if you should die once, which we hope will happen in way, way, way many, many years. But until then, you just go on ruling us. We don't have a problem with this. But we will, of course, accept this Eric of Pomerania as our king when you should die once, if, if that's what you want. Uh, Eric had already been uh, crowned king of um, Norway a few years earlier, though Margaret, of course, as we said, already ruled as his uh, regent. And in 1396, uh, after the um, release of Albrecht on uh, on. Uh, well, you know, uh, condition of his paying the ransom, but also uh, at a time where Margaret realized that he would never be able to do so, she managed to get uh, the Danish nobles to pay him uh, homage as king of De as king of Denmark. While, of course, as we say, he was still um, uh, a minor, and Margaret would continue to rule both De uh, both Denmark and Norway as um, well as as the regent. I'm sorry. This was the moment when she basically had the Kalmar Union declared. The treaty which proposed an everlasting union between Denmark, Norway and Sweden was signed on the feast day of Sir Margaret of Antioch in 1396. Now, why is the feast day of St. Margaret so uh, important a choice? Well, because St. Margaret of Antioch was a girl who was rejected by her father and cast into prison and then eventually, you know, thrown out by him. So you can tell that despite, of course, honoring her father as King of Denmark, Margaret was still perhaps not overly fond of Valdemar's decision to marry her off to Harkon for, well... With a, well, you know, she, she got good things out of it, but she was probably still not too unhappy about it. What it did do, however, was basically create one country out of the previous three, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, under Eric of Pomerania, though it was basically assumed that Margaret would continue ruling it until her death. Um... Uh, so, so that now the union itself 
unfortunate. Well, we'll get back to the union. I'll just say now that it uh, basically fell apart after Margaret's death and was formally declared null and void after the Danish King Christian was kicked out of Sweden in 1523. But for the presence, this had created an incredibly powerful regional dominion of Margaret in the north. She was at this point completely equal to any ruler of uh, Europe with the possible exception of the Holy Roman Emperor and of course as I've said before this made her si simply the most powerful female ruler in well in Europe as I said si between Empress Irene maybe even more powerful than her and Queen Elizabeth of England and I would in fact go so far as to say that Margaret was probably more temporally powerful than even Elizabeth because Elizabeth was after all to a certain degree at that particular point confined to England and was primarily defending England while uh, Margaretta could if she had so desired made some fairly aggressive land grabs because no one was around to stop her she didn't however because again her point and her entire mission was to fight to make the Kalmar Union so secure that it would just become stated fact, even if no one was around to sort of enforce it with armies from the various issues, basically trying to remove the differences between the various countries and get them to accept that Norway, Denmark and Sweden was gone and the Kalmar Union was one country instead. If she had any failure, this would probably be it, because that was never really accepted. It can be argued if it was ever possible to actually get the uh, fratricidal northern countries to accept that they should be one. And even though Eric was king of all of them, and as I said, the union continued to ex exist de facto for another 130 or so years. Yeah, it, it, it never it never really worked. The... It, the, the Popularity of the Union, let's face it, was basically, well, it was united in the person of Margreta. That doesn't mean it couldn't have been successful, but we'll get back to that at the end of the video. Um, however, this basically meant that even though Eric was eventually declared of age and uh, uh, homage was rendered to him in all three kingdoms, he was wise enough to realize that, yeah, this was stepmom that actually had this under control and she remained, with his blessing, the effective ruler of entire Scandinavia throughout her lifetime. As I said, you go, girl. Now, as long as the union was fairly uh, new and insecure, she had basically tolerated the presence of a grand council of the realms. But even then, their uh, influences was minor, and at that time, royal authority remained supreme. That would change. But she even left the uh, titles of uh, such titles as High Constable and Earl Marshal vacant in Sweden. The Danehof, which had been like a collection of great uh, noblemen in Denmark, which had from time to time imposed severe strictures upon the Danish Kim, fell into ruin. Um, she was basically at this point called the Great Queen, the complete ideal despot who ruled through her court officials, who basically, some would call them ministers, they basically served like, you know, clerks of the court to a certain degree. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is Margaret was supreme dictatorial leader of Scandinavia at this point, and it was her will and her will alone that created the union, that maintained the union, and that turned the um, fortunes for all Scandinavian countries around as they were at this time, because this was a time of growth and power for Scandinavia. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into her policies, because then it will basically become something that will probably bore anyone who isn't directly interested in the eternal affairs of Scandinavian countries 700 years ago. Let me just say that according to uh, uh, historians, she might have been the first to actually make punishment for rape a sort of individual punishment in the northern countries rather than as if you rape someone, you're actually doing a crime on their family's you know, honor and property and so on. She made rape uh, punishment into a, or rape into a crime 
all of its own. She restored the, uh, she did some coin reforms, restored the value of the coins, which had, of course, been debased over the previous years, as such tend to be in times of war and chaos. And she tried to regain some of the crown lands. Like, like I said, the countries were now united and all lands that had previously been held by various Scandinavian kings were under Margaret. But a lot of the previous crown lands, which ensured her, her personal uh, finances, had been given out to various nobles to secure their loyalty to various rulers who needed that. Margaret was very keen on regaining some of those crown lands and went at it with great vigor and actually great success. She also seized quite a lot of land back that the church had managed to lay their hands on in the last uh, 100 or so years, but maintained the loyalty of the church by also giving very, very generously to various churches and cathedrals and religious order and so, so on. So overall, there was no sort of real impetus for anyone to go against her in the actual, in her actual domain. She made great efforts to get the local nobility to intermarriage between the various nations, so again to create the sort of sense that the union itself was the nation, but again while that happened it didn't, well we'll get back to that, it didn't really work. As for foreign policy she had basically two objectives, to try to stay clear of large warfare that would deplete her coffers while also regaining just any kind of bits of Denmark and other na other Scandinavian nations that was not under her domain. While she already controlled Gotland from her father's conquest, she eventually managed to pay its actual sort of owners, official owners, a lot of money from her reawakened economy and resurgent economy to actually take it over officially and also eventually bought Schleswig, the last of the Danish territories uh, lost to her. So at this point, which was in the early uh, 15th century, early 1405 and six and so on, she was in complete domination of every single part that had ever been under the Scandinavian kings in Scandinavia itself. It was at this point that she then entered into negotiation with Henry IV of England because he was interested in a double wedding alliance between England and the Nordic Union. The proposal was basically for King Eric, Eric of Pomerania, to marry Henry's daughter and for Hen uh, Henry's son, Prince, uh, Prince Henry of Wales, which was, of course, the future Henry V of England, to marry Eric's sister Catherine. Now, the vision there was, of course, for Henry, that he would gain the single most powerful ally he could probably lay his hands on to help in his war against France. They were in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. Margaret's vision was, of course, that eventually that union would unite to fully recreate Canute the Great, uh, Canute the Great's Great Northern Empire or the Great um, North Sea Empire, which was Scandinavia and uh, Great Britain. Now, the problem was, of course, that England wanted these weddings basically so they could get Margaret to help them directly in the war with France. And if there was one thing Margaret wasn't really keen on, it was war, because she saw what unlimited warfare had done to her predecessors and how it had destroyed, well, most of Scandinavia, and she had absolutely no um, sort of desire to... to, uh, to get involved in that in the same fashion. So the alliance fell through, although the marriage between Eric and uh, Henry's daughter Philippa was eventually, uh, did eventually take place. Now, uh, Henry V, who was supposed to marry um, Catherine, Eric's sister, of course, went on to his great faith. I will may do a video of him sometime, but I feel like I would have to compete with Shakespeare, so uh, yeah, people probably know about him already. Instead, Catherine married a southern German noble, which created a strong ally from the south against some of Margaret's north German enemies, which basically meant that she had them, well, surrounded. So overall, she managed to create some very powerful defensive alliances while recreating and strengthening the Nordic dominion as it was in her own uh, mind. So yeah, as I've said repeatedly throughout this thing, you go girl. We have now reached 1412. 
there were some issues with the payment of Sleesvig, and since Margaret had gained everything else, she decided, okay, if we can't actually get it, we need to go down there with an army and intimidate people into reminding them that we have bought Sleesvig and it belongs with us. So in October, she set sail from Sealand in her ship Trinity and basically arrived eventually in um, Flensburg. At Flensburg, unfortunately, with the Scandinavian realms and Scandinavian power at a height it had only achieved probably, as I've said, under the Great North Sea Empire under Canute uh, 400 years prior and would never achieve again. Margaret um, contracted plague and sadly died aboard her ship in Flensburg Harbor. I feel like this video have sort of shown my admiration for the woman so to end it i will basically state what has been said about her by historians and people also kind of you know at the same time she was described as highly energetic autocratic indomitable she was wise tact just tactful and kind i mean these are the things you say about everyone but as uh, a Hudson Strode wrote, Margaret, who, like St. Bridges, possessed the masculine quality of indomitability, was undoubtedly the strongest in all of Europe at the time. No male public official ever worked harder at his job. She used her constructive ability, her diplomacy, and her iron force of will to make the Union and su a success and maintain the royal prerogative and her own status. I feel that after this video, everyone would agree that that is indubitably true. I certainly do. I do really think she set, or at least should have set, an example for all, uh, well, autocratic rulers that came after her up until such a time as the idea of a single royal ruling the country disappeared in the more democratic and parliamentary reforms of the latter centuries. I will end this video regarding Margaret and then do a little bit of chat about the Kalmar Union itself um, with another couple of quotes. Uh, for instance, Mr. historian Mr. E.C. Otter, who wrote that if Margaret could have been certain of being followed on the throne by rulers as able and just as she had been, this act of the union of Kalmar might have worked for the good of all three kingdoms. For it was quite true, as she, the queen, said, that each one alone was a poor, weak state, open to danger from every side, but that the three united would make a monarchy strong enough to defy the attacks and schemes of the Hansen traders and foes from all sides of Germany and would keep the Baltic clear of danger from foreigners. However, no ruler came after Queen Margaret that was equal to her, just as there had been few before her to be compared. And to quote Richard White, uh, there were troubles in store for Queen Margaret when she assumed the throne, but her unification of the three kingdoms marked the state of a new and prosperous era for the Scandinavian people. In light of the turbulent history of those realms, a history of war and plague and usurpation, Margaret's triumph established uh, her as one of the most remarkable of European monarchs. And I, the sage, can only agree with this in every single particular. I feel this is a person who should have been much more famous, not just in Scandinavia, but throughout Europe and the world, whenever anyone was speaking about medieval history. Okay, that was Margaret. Let me just say something about the Union of Kalmar, just to finish it off. The Union of Kalmar, as I said, basically went on for another 130 years, but because the rulers that came after Margaret was not very competent, including Erika Pomerania himself, despite having been tutored by her for the better part of 30 years, it eventually became obvious that the various countries simply couldn't accept the Union and could accept the sort of unification and their lack of prerogatives towards a at this point fairly omnipotent ruler so things slowly started to collapse and by the 1520s when christian the second of denmark and norway was kicked out of sweden it was all over it did however create the union of denmark and norway which lasted until 1814 and also brought uh, areas such as Finland under Swedish domain, which it would remain for about the same period. It also brought um, Iceland and 
Greenland and the Faroe Islands under De- uh, Denmark, uh, Norway, which to a certain degree they were up until Iceland uh, got themselves uh, independence in the 1940s. And of course, Norway, uh, sorry, Greenland and the Faroe Islands are still part of Denmark today. Now, speculating about alternate history is not the purpose of this video, but one can only suspect what a united Scandinavia might have done to European power policies and especially to the development of Germany as and Prussia as a very powerful militaristic um, disturber of peace in Europe had a powerful union of Kalmar existed under strong kings in Scandinavia. But again, such was not to be. This was, however, not the fault of Margrethe, who did everything she could to make it so, and I feel should be judged on what she had the ability to influence, rather than what her descendants managed to throw away in, well, uselessness. But there, yes, Margrethe I of Denmark. What a girl. So that was it. Probably the longest video I've ever done, but I feel our girl deserves it. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Like I said, this was supposed to, I'm sorry, have gone up on uh, women, International Women's Day on the 8th. But, well, real life intervened. Such is the life of those of us who can't actually make money off of YouTube. So we have to go to work. It sucks. But I hope I, any of you who have watched this have been at least uh, fascinated enough to read up more upon Margaret, because of course this is still only the kind of bare bones version. And I will hopefully eventually get back to at least the time period, probably doing one on her father, who as I said was a fascinating character in her own right, maybe even doing uh, a tragic one as to the destruction of the Kalmar Union with all that entailed. But yeah, uh, again, I can only say I hope you have enjoyed this. Until next time, I have been the Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.